Here now is Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells with Talk to Tom. Sponsored by Greenway Dodge. Rocket launches are beautiful to watch, but it turns out some are leaving space junk behind. We talk more about the pollution high above the sky just ahead. But first, I'm going to be answering your questions. Hello, everyone. I'm Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells. Welcome to Talk to Tom. We've got a great show lined up for you today. If you have never seen Talk to Tom, thank you for being a first-time viewer. What we do here is we take your questions from anyone that wants to submit a question. It used to just be people in Central Florida, but now we're worldwide. So feel free to write in. Go to clickorlando.com forward slash talk to Tom. Submit your question. I'd love to know what you want to know. First question this afternoon comes to us from our friend John Wilson. John writes and says, Some mornings I have dew on my car and other mornings I don't. What causes more moisture when there is dew on the window and other days not? Okay, John, here's the deal. Uh, that's a really good question. I appreciate you being cognizant of the fact that some days we do have a lot of dew on the ground here in Central Florida. Some days we do not. <laughs> See what I did there? Sorry. All right, here's the deal. Uh, in Florida, we are largely an air mass driven kind of weather scene. We're to the time of the year right now where we spend most of our days dry, but there is enough low level humidity that when the temperature crashes and goes really low, clear sky temperature drops low, all of a sudden, what little moisture we have begins to condense. And this is the time of year when the temperature gets just low enough it's like our foggy season. Temperature gets just low enough that instead of all that moisture evaporating, all of a sudden the rate of evaporation is outpaced by the rate of condensation. And we end up with dew. When the temperature reaches what we call the dew point, drops down to where there's no more room for there to be extra humidity in the air. It all comes together and forms little droplets. So most of the time, those droplets will form on a flat surface or a surface that um, can't be warmed. Like if you're, driving, if you're driving your car, your car is warm, no dew. But then your car sits overnight and all of a sudden it cools down and it's not getting any warmth from the ground. Then the moisture begins to collect on your super cooled car. So your car temperature drops without being warmed. All of a sudden it will collect the moisture. And that's where the dew comes from. On mornings when we do not have dew, we have drier air or our temperature did not drop low enough. So great question. Appreciate you, John. Thank you for watching. All right, next up, Louis Baez. Hey, Louis, here's your question. It says, I see people at times cutting their lawns in the rain. Is it safe or can this be dangerous? Or are they asking for trouble? Okay, Louis, I know what's on your mind when you talk about people outside in the rain. Okay, that's, it's okay to mow the lawn in the rain as long as there is no lightning. We're to the time of year now to where we don't have the colliding sea breezes. So, since we don't have colliding sea breezes and big lift and big thunderstorms going on, normally the rain in the afternoon will be a warm front drifting north or just moisture coming in from the east coast. So that's okay for them to be outside in the rain. A gentle afternoon walk in the gentle rain is okay. A walk along the beach in the gentle rain is okay. But if it's a situation where we have enough convection, enough lift and there's cooler air aloft and boom we can fire up a thunderstorm then yes then yes they would be asking for trouble so if you see someone mowing the lawn in a storm or a shower in the summer problematic in the winter time probably not unless there's a big cold front coming now with all that said we are in an el nino winter here as i'm recording this frontal zones will be coming through we will have stormy weather this winter won't be a typical winter without big thunderstorms. We're going to get, mm, I wouldn't say every week, but every two or three weeks this winter, we might have the threat of severe weather. We very well may. Should be a winter when we have above normal showers. and should be a winter when we have below normal temperatures. If everything works out the way I think it's going to through February, March, and April. Great question, Lewis. I appreciate that. Next up is Susan Bullock from Ocala. I love Ocala. Let's talk about it. Hi, Tom. I heard that temperatures are taken this way. The actual temperature is taken in the shade and it feels like temp is taken in the sun. Is that the way it's done? Surely it must be more complicated than that. Thanks, and we love watching you. Thank you, Susan. Love you too. I love that you do watch Talk to Tom. Now, um, obviously, you, you know that's 
Not right. I can tell by the way this is written. When you say, surely it's more complicated than that, if that's how you feel, then you should trust your instincts. Yes, it is more complicated than that. Uh, the wintertime real feel is easier to calculate than the summertime heat index. It requires calculus and a long, convoluted formula. Uh, we also have a chart, but it all is based upon a calculus algorithm, and you can't just simply record one temperature in the sun and say that's the heat index because it has to do with how quickly your body can cool based on the humidity level. It doesn't really have much to do with the temperature in the sun or out of the sun. Obviously, if you're in your car and you're in the sun, then you know. Or if you work in the shade or you step outside in the sun, you know there is a large differential between being in the shade and being in the sun. But all temperatures are taken in a shady box. If you were able to go out to a place where we're taking like an official reading. The temperature, the, the thermometer will not be on your house. Like most people tack them right up you know, to a pole or something. That's not how you do the real temperature. Temperature is taken five feet off the ground and in a vented box so it doesn't get beaten up by the sunshine. Because the sunshine on any thermometer will shoot it like a buck 80 or buck 60. That's not the real temperature. Temperature is about five feet off the ground so that the heat coming off the ground doesn't mess with it and the cooling above you doesn't mess with it. Five feet is about right in a vented box that should be white, not black, so it doesn't heat up and overheat. And the way they do the heat index is a formula and a chart. Thank you for your question. I appreciate it. All right, next question up is from our friend, Sherry. Why does the rain feel like a mist lately instead of like it's falling from the sky? We did just go through a weird time here where the rain felt more misty and foggy. And again, this goes back to one of the earlier questions in that we did not, we are finally in the dry season. So we don't have colliding sea breezes with big thunderstorms. And so far in our winter, we haven't had big cold fronts that slam through here fast and cause big thunderstorms either. So our atmosphere had leftover moisture and our temperature dropped and we had misty, foggy days ongoing. Winds coming in from the Northeast, ushering in fog, dropping our temperatures, making fogginess. And so it was kind of misty and was kind of not raining hard and that's the kind of weather we've been having later this winter we will get cold fronts we will get big storms it will feel like rain and the thunderstorms will be crazy and wicked and feel like maybe an afternoon run for a little bit that we get in the summertime here although normally with the progression of the el nino winters winter storms the front comes through in an hour hour and a half and we're done instead of all day four five six seven eight thunderstorms all right thank you for your questions Anytime you want to submit a question to talk to Tom, just go to clickorlando.com forward slash talk to Tom. We'd love to hear from you. Stick around. Coming up next, we're going to be talking about space junk, how it got there, and if anything is being done to fix it. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Talk to Tom. I'm Chief Meteorologist Tom Sorrells. Along the Space Coast, we see rockets launched from the Cape with alarming regularity. Ignition, engine full power, and liftoff of TRS-28. And liftoff. Go Falcon, go Starlink. It seems like every other day we're throwing a rocket up. We look up, we watch them soar, and new research shows that it is polluting space. Thanks for joining us on Talk Tom. Right now I'm ready to talk to Dr. Daniel Murphy who works at the NOAA Chemical Sciences Laboratory. He joins us now to talk a little bit more about space junk. Hey, Dr. Murphy, welcome to Talk to Tom. No, oh, thank you, Tom. Um, we want to talk about what kind of uh, what kind of junk are you finding out there? Uh, the measurements we were making, they were okay. in the stratosphere at about uh, 60,000 feet altitudes. That's about twice as high as commercial planes are flying. And we were finding products from the burnup of rockets that happens much higher in the atmosphere uh, down in the stratosphere at about 60,000 feet. And that's really what's new. So finding some of the uh, what's left over of the burnup at much lower altitudes than people expected, I think. Wow. So we're not talking outer space. We're talking stratosphere. We're at, like, I'm, I'm going to fly soon. And when I do fly, I'm flying at 50 or 60,000 feet. And you're telling me there's leftover rocket junk there? Yeah, that's right. When the rockets burn up, 
you get vaporized aluminum, you get vaporized copper, uh, other metals, and that burnup's happening at um, 40 to 80 kilometers, so well above 100,000 feet. Wow. And the atmosphere is bringing those metals down in, into the stratosphere. Okay, tell me how much then, because obviously um, you can't see it with the naked eye, can you? Yeah, we're measuring it with a very sensitive mass spectrometer, and uh, the stratosphere has sulfuric acid particles in, its in it that are natural. They're there for natural reasons. And we're seeing small amounts of the metals in those particles. Um, but there's metals, we can find aluminum in about 10% of the particles that are in the stratosphere. And that's something uh, that surprised me when we when uh, we first saw it that, I mean, you say there's launches happening all the time, but there's gonna be a lot more in the future. And if there's already a little tiny bit of aluminum in 10% of the particles, um, that may be something to pay attention to. Yeah, you really have to understand, Doctor, that it, it used to be that we'd launch a rocket once every, you know, six months or four months or something. And now it is really every other week or every two weeks. We've, how many have we launched already this year? We're on a record pace with our SpaceX launches. It's a lot. It's a lot. So is that how these trace elements got there because of our increased rocket use? Or is it just because... It was always happening. Well, I mean, obviously, these trace elements weren't there before mm -hmm. we were putting up any rockets at all. Right. Um, yeah, so they're coming from, actually, probably from things, a lot of it's coming from things that were launched probably some years ago and are just now re-entering the atmosphere. Oh. And also uh, from the burn-up of the upper stages of the rockets um, that are being launched now. Okay. And um, as I said, there's a lot more satellites going to be going in orbit in the next right. 10 years. It's crazy. It's it's amazing to me how many of them there are. Now, let's talk about um, what what kind of impact. Obviously, there's going to be some impact if they're in the uh, jet stream or the jet area, jet flight path. What other impacts mm -hmm. are we talking about here on Earth? Well, we don't think you know, there's going to be impacts at ground level to you know people's health and things. What we're concerned about is that um, the stratosphere is the, um, it's the altitude where the ozone layer is. Right. And we don't know for sure right now that there are any bad impacts from these metals, but it's also a new thing to have found and we don't know what the impacts are. And I think there's always concern if you put some new material in at the same altitude as the ozone layer. Okay, when did you first notice this, this new thing, this new step, finding this, was it like six months ago or a month ago? I don't know how out of the loop I am. Uh, we made uh, measurements uh, on a NASA airplane uh, from Fairbanks, Alaska last uh, February, and it was in looking at the data from those flights uh, that we really started uh, noticing these metals. Okay, um, so now that you've noticed them, I mean, that's pretty soon, a year ago, less than a year ago, as we're recording this, it's been like nine months ago. So let's talk about um, what are we doing now? What steps are we gonna take? What's next? Or is there anything being done to stop the space junk? Um, well, I think, you know, for the scientific community, I mean, people have thought about the space junk that's in orbit and they've, people worry about space junk that comes down and hit people on the ground. Uh, the idea that some of the metals get in the stratosphere is new. So I think what's next is really, um, for instance, laboratory experiments that people will do to try to figure out what properties these metals have in the types of particles that are in the stratosphere. And um, just thinking about what it means, because it's such a new concept, actually, that the metals are in the stratosphere. Yeah, it's so strange. You've got to figure out, does it affect ozone? Does it affect reflectivity of heat? Does it help trap? I, there's a lot of questions. A lot of questions I'm going to have that you're going to have to answer. Um, or at least you can't answer yet, but you're going to try to answer in the future. Uh, talk to me about what else is going on. Obviously, you do all kinds of space research, or you wouldn't have found these metals in the atmosphere. What else are you looking into? Well, one of the, one of the next things we're going to do, I mean, I said we made the measurements from Alaska. So we made measurements uh, in the Arctic at very high latitudes. In a couple of years, we're going to go and make some measurements in the tropics. And 
we actually expect to find less of the space metals in the tropics than we did near the pole, and that's just because of the way the air moves in the upper atmosphere. Um, but um, it's important to know that, and in the tropics, we might find more of what comes from the surface and goes up into the stratosphere and the ozone layer. So basically kind of characterizing different parts of the stratosphere and seeing you know, how far across the stratosphere do these effects extend? And that's probably the next bit of research uh, that I'll be heavily involved in. As I say, there'll probably be other people going into the laboratory and trying to understand the properties of these metals at stratospheric conditions. And what's been the reaction from the folks who launch rockets? Did they go, um, no, we don't think that's right, or yeah, we're going to slow down, or we're going to change something, or is there been any reaction at all? Um, I think uh, it's too new to have a lot of reaction from, for me to at least have heard of those sorts of reactions. What I have seen is a, a lot of interest um, from not only people like you, but, you know, uh, the various scientific magazines that are, you know, are sort of for a popular audience. Uh, so people are clearly interested in this topic. Okay, but Elon hasn't called and said, "Hey, knock it off." No, I haven't heard. <laughs> I haven't heard from Elon yet. Okay, because I mean, it's every other week or two times a week we're launching a SpaceX rocket. It's it's it really amazing and impressive how much work they've been doing. All right, any mm -hmm. other big projects on the horizon for us here that we need to think about with you guys out there in the NOAA Chemicals Laboratories? At some point, we want to look at the Southern Hemisphere and see if the Southern Hemisphere is different than the Northern Hemisphere. You can actually learn a lot uh, by comparing different parts of the Earth with measurements. Yeah, you, you make you wonder, is it coming back and spreading out equally? Good question. Yeah, I guess that's why you're doing what you do and why I'm here. All right, Dr. Daniel Murphy works at the NOAA Chemical Sciences Laboratory. Thank you so much, Dr. Murphy, for taking time out to join us. And thank you at home for watching Talk to Tom. You can download Talk to Tom from wherever you listen to podcasts and watch anytime on News 6 Plus. And while you're on News 6 Plus, make sure to check out all the other episodes of Talk to Tom, like this one about sea turtles. And it's gonna look kind of silly because I'm gonna put this little turtle in a burrito wrap because <laughs> I want the turtle to sit up for this oh. and I'm going to use my hands and use this tube and I, we're using something called sulprophate and it looks a lot like Pepto-Bismol for turtles and other animals but so we're going to go ahead and you're put force feeding in it? the tube Boom. oh it's going in the tube right I'm not into it. forcing it it's going right <laughs> into the tube okay. and this should help Opal to oh. um, it'll coat Opal's stomach a little bit yeah. But I want Opal to be all the way up. I pushed just a little bit of air through there to let it go through. And now we're going to let Opal kind of sit up and let the gravity do wow. some work. In this episode about how our very own Candace Campos lost her home to a hurricane when she was just a child. When I finally fell asleep, I found out, interviewing them for a story I did on ClickOrlando.com, they actually said goodbye to each other. They um, prayed that I would fall asleep and if God forbid something happened, I wouldn't feel it. And I didn't realize that they officially said their goodbyes and, you know, it makes me sad to know that they did that. But thankfully everybody was okay and our safe room saved our lives because you opened up that door, it looked, there was no more home, it was gone. Uh, it, furniture was wrapped around siding from neighborhood, from a house blocks away. Uh, had a boat in our front yard. I mean, we had no roof. We had no toys. We everything that I owned, everything my parents owned, was was gone unless it was in that small half bath. Man, that story kills me. The part of them sitting yeah. there, backs against the wall to hold it up, back against the door to yeah. keep it in. Baby Candace trying to go to sleep and saying goodbye. Yeah. That's. It makes Crazy. me want to cry. I can only imagine yeah. what it does to you. It makes. Yeah, it no, really, it, I can it, feel it welling up in me right now. That's such an yeah. emotional picture for me that, you know having kids you have kids now you can just yeah. I, I really can't imagine watch every episode of talk to tom for free on the new six plus app just download it on your smart tv to get started